chapter 11. We're back in our, our Roman series. Romans chapter 11, the first 10 verses. Romans chapter 11, 1 to 10. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee, the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would, have, would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. And as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes that would not see, ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Let us look to God in prayer. Oh God, how we love your word. How we thank you for your word of God. We ask you, God, that you will open our eyes, that we might see the truth of your word this morning. And that you will give us ears that will hear and minds that will understand and hearts that will be receptive to your voice this morning. Lord, there is absolutely nothing that is hidden from you. You know our condition. You know where we are at in our lives. And so we ask you that you will minister to us. Lord, according to where we are at in our lives. So help us, God. Help us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. If in Romans chapter 6 or 1 to 8, you find a detailed exposition of the gospel, in chapters 12 to 16, you see the application of the gospel, how to live out the gospel life. However, in chapters 9 to 11, as by now you may know, Paul is dealing with a question about Israel. Particularly from chapter 9, verse 30 to chapter 10, all the way to the end of the chapter, we are told that the that Israel, the Jews in Paul's day, sought to establish their own righteousness by their works instead of by faith. And they refused to believe in Jesus as their Savior. They wanted to be their own saviors. Although the message had been preached to them, and God had graciously invited them to believe and be saved, they stubbornly refused. If you remember, we ended with this verse last time I was in chapter 10. In chapter 10, in verse 21, this is how it ends. But of Israel, he says, and that is God, 
All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. There was an invitation for them to come and receive. But they resisted. They did not believe. They were disobedient. They were a contrary people. Now, in light of their stubborn rejection and refusal to believe, Paul asks in chapter 11 and verse 1, if God has fully and totally rejected them in return. Has God rejected his people is a question that Paul asks, and then he answers for himself in this text. And as we look at these 10 verses, I want to present to you three truths from this passage. Number one, God always faithfully preserves a remnant for himself. God always faithfully preserves a remnant for himself. If you look at verse 1, again, Paul says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? He's talking about the Jewish people. He's talking about the people of Israel in general, corporately. Those who uh, refuse to believe. Paul is asking, has God rejected the people of Israel totally and completely? Has he abandoned them because they refused? And Paul's short answer to that question is, absolutely not, by no means. God has not rejected his people. And then he backs that answer with three proofs. The first proof is a personal proof. It's, a, it's Paul's personal proof. Notice what he says in verse 1, the, the latter part of verse 1. By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, Paul is saying, if you say that God has completely and totally rejected Israel, then how would you explain my conversion? I myself am an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. In fact, I'm a member of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. In fact, Paul was not just an Israelite. He was a zealous, he was passionate. He was a passionate Jew, so much so that in Philippians chapter 3, he describes himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews, if you remember. And Paul's point is, how can you say God rejected Israel if I, being an Israelite, have experienced God's salvation? Paul was such a zealous Jew that he was one of the staunchest opponents and oppressors of the church. If you read through the book of Acts, this is how he describes his former life in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 to 14. I thank him who has given me strength, Jesus Christ our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. But then he says about his former life. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. That is who Paul was. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was a hardcore opponent of the Christian faith. In fact, in the same passage there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, I'm a chief of sinners. I'm a foremost of sinners. And Paul is saying, listen, I'm an Israelite. 
and I was the worst of sinners among them. And if God had mercy on me, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ flowed for me to save me, how has God rejected Israel? Paul's salvation is a proof that God had not rejected Israel totally. Perhaps you are here this morning and you have a similar misconception about various things about God and even the gospel. And you're probably thinking the, the salvation that Christ has to offer is not for you really. You think God has closed the door on you because you are from a certain religious background or you are non-religious or because you have lived a certain kind of life. But can I tell you something? If you talk to most of us here, we have a story to tell. We have a story like Paul's. We had a formal life and how God intervened in our lives. And the truth is, if God had mercy on us, wretched sinners, if God had mercy on us, there is hope for you as well this morning. And so maybe you have to lay aside your assumptions. Like the assumptions of some of these Jews in Paul's day who, who thought, okay, God has abandoned, God has rejected. There is no hope. Maybe you need to lay aside your assumptions and, and come to Jesus this morning. Paul's proof that God had not rejected Israel, the first proof was that his own personal conversion. Number two, he gives us a second proof here in this passage, if you look at the second verse. And that proof is a theological proof or a doctrinal truth or a proof. It says in verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Here in this verse, he talks about God's relationship with Israel. It's not about talking about the individuals in Israel, but the nation, especially in this context, he's talking about the nation of Israel in general, that God foreknew his people. And I did an entire sermon on this when we were going through Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. And we said, the word foreknew, foreknew here does not mean to foresee. God did not set his heart on Israel or did not choose Israel because he saw something good in Israel. But the word foreknew means that he foreloved. He set his heart on love on Israel even before the foundations of the earth were laid, even before it was formed as a people or as a nation. God chose Israel as a special people, as his covenantal people. And Paul's argument is that how can God, whom God set his heart on in covenantal love, totally reject them? God cannot, and God will not reject his people whom he foreknew. That's his second proof. And yet, although here it's talking about Israel corporately, as a people, I think this is true of every single believer as well, my brothers and sisters. God foreknew you. God did not see through the tunnel of time and saw that you would choose him or you were good or you would be obedient. And based on that, God did not choose you. But God freely set his heart on you even before you were formed in your mother's womb and in time he saved you and will one day complete the very work that he began in you. 
And yet there may be those moments, those, those low points in your lives as, as believers, when we feel like God has abandoned us. Those moments of darkness, the moments of struggling to walk in holiness. But listen, dear brother, dear sister, here's the truth that you probably need to hear this morning. Whom God foreknew, he will not forsake. Yes, when you persist in sin, he will in love discipline you, he will prune you, but he will not abandon you. That's the truth of this verse. Whom God foreknew, he will not reject. Paul is proving here to his audience that God has not rejected Israel. He gave two proofs so far, a personal proof and a theological proof. Number three, you find in verses two to five, the latter part of chapter, uh, verse two, all the way to verse five. Let's read that. He says, do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what is God's reply to them? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. In these verses, Paul takes us back to the Old Testament scriptures, and particularly during the time of Elijah. And if you remember in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah has a showdown with the prophets of Baal, and he defeats them. And in chapter 19, Jezebel, King Ahab's wicked queen, hears about it and threatens to kill Elijah. And Elijah, the mighty prophet of God, is now afraid and he's running for his life and he hides in a cave. And out of frustration and self-pity, he cries out to the Lord and he appeals to the Lord and he says, Lord, the whole nation has turned against you in idolatry and apostasy. I am the only one who's left, who's loyal to you. And God answers by saying, listen, Elijah, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah thought he was the only one who was left. Elijah thought he was the only one who was loyal. But God kept 7,000 men who did not bow down to a false god. Because God faithfully preserved a remnant for himself. Now, why is Paul saying this here? Why is Paul referring to Elijah's appeal and God's answer? And that's, you find that in verse 5. He's trying to connect that. And he's saying in verse 5, so too at the present time, just like it was in Elijah's time, when Elijah thought, you know, there was nobody else who saved God. There's nobody else who is um, loyal to you, God. There's nobody else who's faithful to you, God, anymore. And God points out and says, listen, I have preserved. Paul is saying, in the same way, Even at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. People in Paul's day thought, okay, it's done and dusted. You know, God has abandoned, you know, his people. And God reminds, or Paul reminds us, or his audience saying, there is a remnant even today just like in the day of Elijah. 
In fact, in the book of Acts, you would remember at Pentecost that 3,000 Jews believed and were saved. By the time you come to chapter 4 and verse 4, the number grew to 5,000. By the time you come to Acts chapter 21 and verse 20, James tells Paul that many thousands of Jews have believed. That's precisely Paul's point. God had not indeed rejected Israel. He has been graciously saving and preserving a remnant for himself, even in Paul's day. And that should be of great encouragement to us as well today. There is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Christians are um, a minority in this world. And no matter which part of the world you live in, with each passing day, things are becoming more and more anti-Christian, isn't it? You go to work, you are the only Christian in your team, probably. You're in school and you are the only one in your class who holds on to a biblical worldview. And sometimes you are probably discouraged. And like Elijah, appeal to God and say, God, I am the only one, God. What do I do? What is the point of all this, God? But the truth is, the God who kept 7,000 in Elijah's day, in the midst of a national apostasy, is a God who saved and kept people in Paul's day, is a God who is saving people and preserving a people for himself even today. Amen. Now, things may seem just the opposite, brothers and sisters, but the truth is the Lord is at work. If you don't believe, look around in this very hall. <laughs> Do you think you're alone? The Lord has faithfully kept a people for himself. Not just in this hall, but throughout this city, this very moment, there are a number of people, brothers and sisters, who are worshiping the Lord, whom the Lord has kept in his faithfulness. And yet Satan wants us to believe we are all alone. And the more we feel that way, the more we uh, get discouraged, isn't it? And that's why I believe with all my heart that we must take our Christian fellowship very, very seriously. Our fellowship with one another is something that we need to be very intentional because the more we fellowship, the more we encourage, we are more encouraged with each other's presence. The more we are pouring into each other's lives, we recognize, listen, I'm not the only one. We have one another. But the more you isolate yourself, the more discouraged you will end up being. And that's what Satan wants from all of us. He wants us to be discouraged. He wants us to be beaten. He wants us to, you know, be there and live in that self-pity. But we need to understand. We need to be with each other. Then you realize there's so many more that the Lord has preserved now, Paul is saying all that. Let me remind you again, just in case it slipped out of your mind. I'm just trying to bring, it, bring you back on track. Paul's answer, he's trying to answer a question in verse 1. And the question is, has God abandoned? And Paul is saying, no, absolutely not. What is the proof, Paul? Listen, I am an Israelite, isn't it? Am I not saved? How is that possible? And then he says, listen, whom God foreknew. These people are not, you know, just like anybody else. God foreknew them. And God continues to be faithful to them. He has not forsaken. And then he reminds from the example of Elijah. Just like in Elijah's day, when you thought, when we thought, okay, there is nobody else who's faithful to God. In the same way, I have kept 
people for myself. The remnant is a proof that God had not completely rejected Israel in, in spite of their stubborn rejection of him. Here's my second point, and it's pretty brief. The second one is the remnant exists by grace. The remnant exists, but how? How do they exist? They exist by grace, is what Paul says. Look at verse 5. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. After declaring that the remnant there is a remnant of God's people in, in Paul's day. Paul is very quick to clarify that the basis of their existence. Some Jews did not become believers because they were more righteous than others. Paul did not experience salvation because he did some things better than others. Or more, he, he was more righteous than his fellow Jews. In Paul's testimony, he was a chief of sinners. But how was Paul saved? How were others, other Jews in Paul's day saved? Paul's answer is, they were chosen by grace. They deserved to be abandoned. They deserved hell. They deserved to be separated from God forever. But they were saved by grace. Brother, sister, that, this is true of you and me as well. We talked about being like a remnant in, this, remnant in this world, isn't it? But if God saved us and kept us as his own in this world, it is not because God saw something wonderful about us. It's not because you were somehow, uh, he saw that you were a good person or, or you were better than your friends. It's purely the grace of God. He chose us in his grace. And grace is this unmerited favor of God. It is God's gracious kindness to undeserving sinners. That's you and me. We're not saved by 50% grace and 50% of our amazing works. We're not even saved by 50% or 90% of grace and 10% of, you know, some of my good parts, you know. My moral values, my family or something like that. And it is all of grace. And the, mom the moment you add anything of your own to grace, Paul says, Grace would no longer be grace. As John Newton wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But the sister, may I ask you something this morning? Is God's grace still amazing to you? Are you still in awe of the grace of God? Is it still a sweet sound to you? Or has it become a mere you know, Christian jargon that you use every Sunday, every time in your prayer and everything? Somehow you, after years of being a Christian, you look back and say, oh, maybe it was something about me. You're chosen by grace alone. As the old hymn goes, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. We brought nothing of our own merit. We simply clung on to what Christ has done for us on the cross. Friend, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, this is the only way you can be saved. It's nothing that you can bring and show to God and say, yes, God, I have done some 
really bad things, but you know some of the good things that I have done. My friends, it's not by your works. It's not based on your merit. It's on what Christ has done for you and me. Grace is basically what, God, what we could not do for ourselves. We were rebels. We couldn't just turn to God. What we couldn't do for ourselves, God did it for us. That is grace. What we couldn't pay for, for our sins, Christ paid for our sins when he died on the cross. Now, all you have to do this morning is repent of your sins and trust in him. Grace. It's by grace. And finally, the third point is this. Those who reject the truth in unbelief will be hardened. The rest of the verses from verse 7 onwards, this is what you see. If you look at verse 7, Paul says, What then? Israel failed to obtain what, is, what it, it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Israel as a nation, what was it seeking? And what was it that it failed to obtain? Romans chapter 10 and verse 3 tells us what it was seeking. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Israel as a whole, they were seeking a right standing before God based on their own efforts, on their own merit, on their own righteousness, and they utterly failed, is what Paul's saying. And that's just not Israel's problem then. It is a problem of every fallen human being. Every religion of the world has this. They want to have a right standing before God based on their own works. My problem is they will utterly fail. And maybe you're trying that this morning. And you're trying to say, hey, this is my resume, my spiritual resume. My friend, it will utterly fail. It will not stand before God. It will not give you a right standing before God. But notice what it says in verse 7. The elect. There is this entire nation of Israel. And they sought their own righteousness. And they failed, but within that entire nation, there was this remnant, the, the elect. Those who were chosen by grace, it says they obtained it. They obtained a right standing before God, not by their own efforts, but by simply trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So how is someone saved? It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. They obtained it. They trusted in Jesus. And they were made right before God. But here's the tragedy. The later part of verse 7 says, but the rest were hardened. The rest were hardened. Those who trusted received. The elect, those who were chosen by grace, received a right standing before God. But the rest, the others, came under the judgment of God. They were hardened. Here's the terrifying truth about it, my friends. Please listen to me carefully. Those who stubbornly reject the truth in unbelief, 
those who refuse the gift of righteousness that God freely gives us will eventually be hardened. Hardening here is God's judgment. It is a process of God giving them over to their own stubbornness. When somebody stubbornly refuses God's gift, you know what God does? And I shared with you, you know, sometime back when I was talking about it as well, that God simply steps aside. And he allows you to be hardened. A hardened person will harden even more. It's like this cement the quality of the nature of cement is to harden. Sinful people will only get worse and worse and worse and be ultimately destroyed. And there are two results because of this hardening. If you look at verse um, 8, it says, God gave them a spirit of stupor. In other words, a spirit of numbness a spirit of loss of all sensitivity. Not that they were, you know, sensitive before, but the hardness hardens even more to a point where the eyes would not see anymore. The ears would not hear anymore. And that's what happened to majority of Jews in Paul's day. They heard the gospel that was graciously preached to them. But they refused and refused and refused. And Paul says, they've been hardened. They've been hardened. And this is the dreadful truth, my friends. Each time you hear the gospel, each time you hear the word and not respond to it, the more this is what is happening. You may be thinking, nothing is happening, I'm fine. But the more you hear and the more you do not respond, the more you reject, the more you become numb to the truth of it. And that's why sometimes I, I wonder, why is it that people who grow up in church, who keep hearing the gospel, and who keep putting it off to another time, why is it that they become so numb to the glorious truth of the gospel? It's because every time you hear, every time you put it off to another time, listen, another layer of hardness is forming in your heart. And I'm pleading with you this morning. If you hear God's voice this morning, do not harden your heart. That's what Paul, um, the psalmist says in Psalm 95. The other result of hardening, we'll close with this. It says in verse 9, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Their table becomes a snare and a trap for them. Table here ref refers to their physical appetites and pleasures. The very things that they run after will ultimately become a trap, a stumbling block that leads them to their ultimate destruction. When God hardens, not only you become numb, but God just steps aside. He lets you pursue your own things. It can be your own materialism, your riches, your fame, your sinful pleasures. You will go harder and faster after them until it leads you to your own destruction. But friend, the point of all this is, listen, it's not too late for you to turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus today. He is gracious. He is merciful. But turn to him. Because before it's too late. Let's pray.
God, we thank you that you are faithful. You are true to your word. That you faithfully, in your grace, Lord, you have chosen us to be your people. It's only the work of grace, God. And so, may we never boast in our own things, in our own works, in our own righteousness. May we boast in the grace that we have received through Jesus Christ. There's nothing good in us. There's nothing great about us. But you had mercy on us, God. How amazing is your grace towards us. But Lord, I also want to pray for those who have been hearing, Lord, week after week. Or maybe they've heard it so many times that they just don't. I don't know, Lord, but I ask you that you will help them. Please have mercy on them, God. Help them not to, Lord, walk out of this place this very morning, oh God, without, Lord, just receiving that grace. The grace that changes their lives forever and ever. Help them, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I